I haven't been taking a shower every morning because it's bad for your oh we're recording now great <laughs> yes <laughs> I'd, I'd say that we were going to edit that out but i i don't <laughs> So we're gonna do the old thing where 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 Chris would say something very bizarre at the beginning, and we and we'd all be like, "What the heck is he talking about?" Yeah, exactly like that. I mean, okay. I agree with you. I don't feel like you have to every day. I don't wash my hair every day. <laughs> yeah, you know? but okay. So hello everyone, and welcome to this exciting Club Moffat Talks. I am one of your co-hosts, uh, Joseph McNeely, and I'm an instructional librarian here at Moffat. And I am Ryan Samuelson. I am the Associate University Librarian for uh, Public Services. Uh, not with us today is um, Chris DiPanetta, who is enjoying the birth of his second daughter. Yes. I hope he is. I hope he is actually enjoying it. I hope he's got enough downtime that he can enjoy it. Um, yeah. Because I, I, I know that having a baby in the house just by itself takes a lot of yeah he's got a baby and a toddler yes so. yes it's it's a lot yeah yeah um less less than two years of difference between their ages but uh ezra's like what 18 months 19 months do you know that something like that yeah uh, but yeah, so he's 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 doing that, and we'll he'll be back for our January podcast. And we're I going think. to. Well, he may not. It depends on when it is. Well, uh, because for our January podcast, we are looking at having a special podcast that's going to be recorded a little bit later in the month than normal. Um, I think that he'll be here. I think okay. that he'll be here. Um. That room is going to be filled with stuff at that point, is it not? Yes. The our our new podcast studio that's uh being housed here at Moffat Library, um, the physical building part of the room has been completed. And I believe that equipment is supposed to be delivered the first week of January. Yeah. Okay, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that, that that's ryan knowing full well that whenever they tell me so that oh yes this will be fully available by this time it almost never is um unfortunately yeah i i don't i don't know i'm i have been uh fortunate enough to be included in in several of the conversations regarding the new studio but i don't know anything about the minutia of how it all works or fits together um so i i don't know um yeah well happy holidays everybody um it is currently the week of finals so we are slowly winding down the year uh here at moffett library um yeah. oh i saw today that they were putting up all the books that they were going to do the christmas creative so they decide not to do the Christmas tree out made of books thing, unfortunately. I always have mixed feelings about using books as decoration. No, that's not true. I really don't have mixed feelings about it. I hate it. I hate using books as decoration. Um, like I hate it on design shows where they group books by color or they have them where they put books on on a, a display shelf but they deliberately turn them around so that you just see the you know the open pages or the big one they do is they'll do legal books because those are cheap as heck because those become obsolete after a certain point yes so you just see row upon row of illegal um legal books be behind somebody on a, a, you see it a lot of times in like um small films small independent films and sure. commercials and things like that yeah yeah i i i hate that and um, when they do, when they like make a structure out of books or or when they cut into a book to use it as a sculpting material, it's it's very cringy to me. I hate it. No, oh. I on the other hand love destroying books. Um, <laughs> now I, I should I should uh, preface this by saying I was a government document librarian. For many years in fact i still am the government document librarian here 
Um, but uh, government documents, because of their legal nature, are required to be destroyed after a certain time, some of them. Uh, working in retail for ever, uh, we had a thing with uh, unsold paperbacks mm. that, that they would not be returned to the publisher. You would tear off the front cover mm -hmm. and then ostensibly you would throw the books away. And at least one of the companies that I, I worked for had a thing where um, when that was being done, uh, employees would take the take books, any any books they were interested in. And the idea being is you, you, you'd you mail the covers back to the company to get refunds. Yes. Just so people understand. It's not that the company just wants you to destroy books. That's not what's no, going on. No, no. It's just that to, to, to the shipping for a hundred covers is a lot less than the shipping for a hundred books. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a, a matter of practicality. Um, yeah. Well, I know in the past when they did make the displays, we had bound periodicals, which are usually yes. used. And that wasn't that big a deal. Also, it was very pretty because we could grab all the green ones and, and make some big, huge tower right. of, a, of, a, of a Christmas tree out of the green books and stuff like that. And it was usually a, um, we'd talk to the serial librarian and they'd say, well, this one's never ever used. No one ever uses this one. So go ahead and use it for Christmas. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't quite like you're saying what it would have been, you know, several hundred various random books throughout the library. It was it was specifically a, a, a collection of bound periodicals that we knew wasn't being used for the most part. Yeah, that that is one of the things that I don't like about doing stack of book sculpture display things in the library is because unless you have put it into the system that those books have been checked out then people can come in and go, oh, hey, I'm looking for this book. Oh, yeah, it's the third one from the bottom over there on, you know, the, the tree sculpture. Now, we've talked to Allison before in the past. Allison is our, is our outreach um, coordinator. And um, she has done that uh, anytime she pulls books for displays and things of that nature. Yeah. Oh, by the way, she wants something new for January. Have you picked yours yet for the winter one? I don't know that I, I did that. I, I haven't either. I, I've been thinking about it. I've been mulling it around in the back of my head, but I don't know. Yeah. I hope we don't have to do this every single month because after a while, I'm going to run out of ideas. I I could see it becoming a, a, a monthly trend. Oh, Lord. Yes. Okay, I need to find some website that just picks random books. I At, <laughs> at least one of the times already, I won't tell you which time, but at least one of the times already, the thing that I selected was not something that I had personally uh, viewed or read. Oh, the one for one for December is something I have not actually seen, but I love the director. So I just. Okay. So I'm, I'm there with you. I'm worse, though, because um, every single time, whatever I pick is not here in the building. Oh. So Allison always contacts me and goes, OK, what's your second pick? Yeah. That that has hindered a choice or two of mine uh, because because of that. Oh, let me let me let me let me clarify that. I am a librarian. I do look it up in our catalog mm -hmm. to see if we own it. Uh -huh. We do actually own the thing. It's just not here in the building. It's lost. Oh no! Oh, that's very sad. twice already. Oh, oh, I hate. That means I'm picking popular stuff. At least is what that means. Yeah. It's... <laughs> popular with burglars or something i don't know that's that's a weird niche you know um okay did uh did you ever finish reading the books you're supposed to read for your class next semester or um no okay. <laughs> you have time uh, um I've, I've got into it and well if you really want to know um, one of the books we're doing is Lovecraft Country, and it was really hard for me to get started on those books because they're not in Lovecraft style at all. In fact, they're in something I call the anti-Lovecraft style. Okay. So I was reading, I read the first story. It's 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 like Ray Bradbury. Each chapter is a is a is a self-contained story, but overall they tell a story arc. Okay. Ray Bradbury does the same sort of things with his books, usually, his novels. They're a collection of short stories that tell an overall arc arcing story 
But I read the first one. I go, this is the worst horror story I've ever read in my life. This is a horrible, horrible um, um, uh, horror story. And then I read the second one. I go, okay, he's doing this on purpose. So why is he doing this? And I thought long and hard about it. And I realized it's not a horror. It, they're not horror stories. They're black satire stories. He's actually making fun of the Lovecraft uh, styles, what he's doing. Yeah. And so once I got to that that mindset, I could enjoy the stories a lot more. But you know how you, you expect something out of something? Yeah. And it's not what it's like, especially with genre. That's a big thing with me of genre. Sure. If I expect to go something go into something as a horror and it ends up being a comedy, or if I go expecting a comedy and it ends up being horror, I really get upset because I'm not prepared for it. But once I get prepared to get my mindset, oh, I need to follow these tropes and be like this, then I'm much better at it. But that's one of my my failings. So I've had a hard time getting into Lovecraft Country as one of the books, just because uh, it took me forever to realize, oh, this is he's he's doing this on purpose. He's he's this is supposed to be deeply well, he, and, and there is a reason for it too. Um, um, I won't go into it. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, next next year when we talk about I talk about my class on on the weird, sure. but um, the, he's doing something specifically um, in. Re- in a response to Lovecraft's beliefs and Lovecraft's um, style. Let me put it that way. Okay. It's really quite clever now that I figured it out. But anyway, so now I was having problems reading it uh, uh, over the weekend and I just haven't got around to it. I probably will. I'm going to, I'm going to save them up and read them over Christmas break. Cause I'll have a long a period of time to do something like that. Sure. Okay. So no, I didn't do my homework. Thanks for pointing me out. And I only mention that because I know that Peter doesn't watch these videos as much as he used to. Oh, does he not? No. As he 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 was he's like the one person that I count I count on as being like, oh, there's there's our one fan, you know. I know, but he he admits he hasn't because I mentioned something to him and he was like, oh, when did that happen? I go, oh, you have not been watching our videos, have you? Uh, I I'm deeply disappointed now. You hear that, Peter? We're dis- deeply disappointed in Peter and Dr. Peter Fields here at MSU University. Yeah, because he is not um, he is not watching our, our our videos, unfortunately. Not not supporting our efforts. That's so. If any of you students watch our videos, and you you know Peter Fields, call him out on it, please. Yeah. Well, what are we doing today? Oh, wait. Do we want to talk about what we're reading lately and what we're doing? Yes. Um, I, I mean, I, I feel I feel like maybe it's not fair to talk about the the weird books for you because I feel like that is actually work reading. Have you done any for fun reading or what? Have you watched any shows? Well, I'll movies? tell you what I've been doing lately. Okay. It involves you, actually. Okay. And you're like, what? Uh-uh, what? What? Um. My gaming group hasn't has only met like twice in the last three months, and so I reached out to um to, to to Joe here to ask if I could join his gaming group. So what I've been working on is I've been working on my campaign bible for the group. Ah. Is what I've been working on lately. Okay. So I haven't really been watching much. I haven't been doing much. I have been watching the new Doctor Who um, uh-huh. stuff, but that's that's the only stuff I've, stuff I've been watching. Okay um i've watched i've watched the doctor who specials the ones that they've had uh this this month um i i really enjoyed them uh, i did too yeah i thought they were quite well done i felt like because there there are three of them and of the three i felt like the middle was the weakest of the three but i still i really like the middle one honestly did? Tell okay. the truth. yeah i mean it, yeah. It, they're, they're different styles and one of the things i liked is uh, Davies really took uh, uh, took some notice from what Moffat was doing, and he's he said he's going to make it more fantastical, mm-hmm. with the idea that um, again the third one brings in a a longtime villain of, of of Doctor Who who was very mystical and magical in his in his in his powers, and he says he's going to play off of that. Have you seen the video for the fourth and last one of the year? Um, I've not seen a video for it. I, I know that at the end of the third one they had said Christmas, but I I didn't I didn't watch a trailer. Well, for this it. this isn't really a spoiler, but goblins. It's going to be about Christmas goblins. Okay. Well, that'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. 
gotta gotta love a good christmas goblin oh no there there's 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 dozens of them there are lots oh, of them nice um I, I I did watch those Doctor Who specials. Um, I've gotten to see a couple of uh, movies since the last podcast. Um, actually went to the theater and saw the Marvels, which I really, really Oh, I, I did too, but I think I mentioned that last time. Oh, no, this yeah. um, and then uh, just this weekend, uh, fin finally got to see uh, the Barbie movie. Oh. And uh, I really, really liked it. Uh, there's a, a thing in it that... Um, I sort of refer to as a truth rant, and I love a good truth rant. Um, there's there's one that's been turned into reels and memes all the time. That's the the one from the TV show Newsroom, yeah. where there's the guy that talks about the reasons how and why America is not the greatest nation in the world. Um, and then the truth rant in Barbie, just about the contradictory and unrealistic expectations that women are held to uh that uh america ferrera uh does in in the movie and it's amazing yeah as you know i don't care about spoilers i have not seen the film but i have watched a lot of videos on youtube so i've actually seen that scene so i know what yeah. you're talking about yeah but uh yeah just a, a beautiful truth rant and i i loved it um what else have I done? I have been reading, but not a lot. Um, I had read the kids' book that I showed off at the, at the last podcast, and I'm still reading the uh, Jim Butcher Dresden Files series. I'm on uh, the book called Turncoat now. I'm not, I don't know what number it is, but that's the one that I'm on now. Um, but yeah, that's 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 it. And the um, I've talked to since we're just going to do this on the podcast. Um, I talked to my family about your interest in, in getting together with us for role-playing. Uh, and uh, Athena suggested that you may not really know what you're getting into and, and that what we should do is that we should invite you to come over to our house and just watch us play one of our regular sessions okay. so that you know how 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 we do it and uh and and then, there are different styles and you have to adjust your style to match yeah. how people do stuff and i agree so uh probably sometime some weekend in january we'll see cool. if you can, can come over um for for that um and i know that there's a little bit of differences between dungeons and dragons and pathfinder but i feel like it's a relatively small it, 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 all it really is and i mentioned this before all pathfinder is is Pazio was fired from Wizards of the Coast working as a subcontractor for them. And so what they did is they took the 3.5 um, assistance, doc assistance re reference document and they added in all of the free, really well done home rules that were also system reference documents as well. Mm -hmm. And they basically made it best of 3.5 is what they did. And it works very, very well. In fact, me and my friends were very angry with it when it first came out because we had been house ruling stuff for a while to fix little problems with 3.5. Sure. And then we're like, well, what did they do? How did, oh, that's much better than what I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so again, I, I like I like the system. And, and you, as you said, are they familiar with 3.5 at all? 3.5 is what we do. Okay. Yeah. They'll be very familiar with it. It's a... There's a few small differences, but for the most part, it's 3.5 with with a bunch of house rules, basically. So you view it. Yeah, we we do a very blended kind of uh, game because okay. primarily, like. Uh, combat and spells and character creation we're doing uh the 3.5 stuff uh but we've done character races from uh fourth and or fifth edition gotcha um the 
majority of the adventures that I've been taking them through, because in, in my group, I'm the, the DM, mm-hmm. um, the majority of the adventures we've been going through have actually been first and second edition adventures. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's very, you know, uh, and it's it's interesting to go into those first and second adventures, uh, second edition adventures and and make the statistical changes needed to be able to play it in the 3.5 system. I've got uh, rules for that, by the way. Sure. Of <laughs> How to adapt are. to 3.5. Um, but uh, uh, um, that's no problem because first off, I create my own races. I create my own classes. I sort of create my own classes. What I really do is I take a lot of the classes that were not converted over to um, to Pathfinder because I was using the classes in 3.5. Some of them didn't convert over. Some did. So I'm using, and I've got slightly different rules because I'm adapting a few other rules um, as well. And, and, and But my system has been play tested the heck out of um, because um, I've been using the system for 15 years now and it, it, it's just been play tested over and over again. And it's been tweaked left and right. And I play with, in fact, the, the next week um, we're hopefully getting together. Um, I play test with two other GMs, mm. guys who also um, do game mastering as well as well as playing and we we are constantly saying have you tried maybe twisted doing this or changing that to fix this problem or and we all have slightly different systems because we all want slightly different things out of the system sure. but the base rules that i use for my house rules are basically the same between all three of us mm-hmm. so that's not a problem like i said I, I do my own my own races my own classes so when you're saying you're, you're using mixed i'm kind of like well here's the thing too and you know this for a fact is back in the day when you were doing first edition the rules kind of suck so you kind of had to make your own rules you had to yeah. do your own stuff and so yeah. forth yeah um first edition was not the best edition uh i i can i i, I will just make that a declarative statement um but yeah the uh it's funny too because i learned to play that my freshman year of high school and there's things that are still stuck in my brain about that system including simple things like the fact that the abilities were listed in a different order oh yeah oh yeah because it was uh struidicot <laughs> where it was uh the strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, charisma, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and it was just all like, really? Um, well, I like the fact the Wizard Coast changed it because they grouped the physical ones all together, and then they yeah. grouped the mental ones all together. Yeah, and that 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 just you look at you look at them changing it and go, oh, that makes so much more sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, or the thing where the the armor classes used to be that the better protected you were, the lower the number was. And now the better protected you are, the higher the number is. Yeah. And the armor was weird too, because how it worked was basically, well, again, I, I say this because I use a slightly different system. I, I just realized 3.5 still uses the same system. It doesn't matter what the armor is made out of. It matters how much of your body it covers. Right, right. Yeah, that 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 is a thing uh or, or or you know maybe 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 should be um yeah um also there was, it was interesting because there was all these rules what what ADD really was was all of these various house rules that didn't fit together to some extent and they tried to stuff them all together into, into the thing and it didn't quite work Remember weapon speeds? I know no one who ever used the weapon speed the weapon speed rules. No, that was I I I hated that. Um well I I I even hated the thing where it was like um your number of ta- of attacks and you'd you'd get to that place where you'd have three attacks every two rounds, you know, where you'd have yeah, yeah, yeah. one attack the first round, two attacks the second round, and then the third round you'd be back to one attack again uh that um the the really bizarre really uneven uh advancement system oh so yeah oh yeah yeah just horrifying I mean, well it was interesting because if you played the wizard you were stuck in like in like just being 
hey, I'm just happy to be here until a certain point, then suddenly you you ruled the party. I mean, it was that's literally how it worked and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 Um yeah, where they standardized the the, the progression system, where they um a lot of, Wizards of the Coast did a lot of really good things. They brought in a lot of good designers who who really cleaned up the system and made it really good. Yeah. And honestly, I understand why they went to with fourth edition because there's a certain type of gamer that did not appeal to it all. And then they found out that the certain type of gamer is a small minority of the people out there. Uh -huh. And then they went to fifth edition, and fifth edition is sort of a return to third edition, but much more um, accessible to the general public, I guess is how I would describe um, fifth yeah. edition. There's there's some things that I look at in fifth edition um, where I look at it and I have to, because it's different from three or 3.5, I have to look at it and puzzle it out and figure out what it is that they did. And then sometimes I'll be like, okay, I see what you did there. That makes sense to me. I understand why you did it, but I don't like it. <laughs> well, if we're going to talk about that, one thing that really makes me mad, and I understand why they do it. But I'm of the, I'm very much of the idea that every single class has a different role, and they shouldn't all be equal in combat. Is is and that's one of the things they did with fourth edition and fifth edition. I really don't like because what they did is they made okay the rogue needs to be equal to the fighter in combat. And I'm like no 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 no. If the rogue gets into combat, the rogue failed. The rogue's job is to avoid combat. Right. The rogue's job is to sneak past the guards to fast talk the merchant to um to sneak attack and kill the the monster before it knows it's there that's the job of the rogue if yeah. the rogue is in combat the rogue is should be going oh crap i messed up yeah and that's just my theory of things the fighter should be best at fighting and that's it i mean and because they have weaknesses at least in my games they do they don't have the skill points and not having the skill points will get you killed oh sure yeah also, yeah, again, I, they're, they're they're a good defense against the wizard, you know, because this again this is a this is something that came about from my my the again the other GMs I played with, where a friend of mine said, yeah, if if a a wizard should be very careful what he says around the fighter if he's within arm's reach. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And 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 the fighter should watch what he says and with with the with wizard. The, wizard, the wizard's way over there. <laughs> it's like, yeah, or has had or has had like fifteen minutes to prep. You know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's like uh, and or or the thing about how every room is the right size for a fireball. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, things like that. Yeah. Okay, have we thoroughly discussed what's going on in our lives? I would love just to talk about D and D for the rest of the evening. Uh, okay, Honestly, I know you wanted to get to 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 what you love, and that's that's the uh, the children's books. Yeah, the I I okay, I want us to talk about children's books, and there's a couple of reasons why I want to do that. Uh, one reason is that I do have the uh, oversight managerial uh, responsibilities for what we call CML, our curriculum materials library, which is our youth literature. Uh, and it is pre-K through 12th grade, fiction and nonfiction. And part of it is that, just that I have that responsibility. So I you know, see kids' books, but I love them. Um, uh, books have always been important to me, always. And that started foundationally because of children's books. Um, and I feel like that there's a couple of things that I want to talk about. One thing is, is that I regularly hear people come into our academic library and ponder why it is that we have youth books. Uh, so I do want to mention that. Uh, and then just the, the, the magnificence of them. Um, okay, so one of the reasons that we have our collection is because they are actually used by one of our fields of study on campus. They are used regularly 
by the uh, West College of Education. Um, and uh, those are, that is the, for those not familiar, um, that is the program that instructs future teachers. And future teachers need to have access to materials that will exist in their school libraries. Um, we also have things that are not books. We have the things like manipulatives and flashcards and stuff like that, um, dry erase boards and you know all kinds of things like that, uh, building logs and stuff, uh, puppets, um, and then a bunch of books. And um, we need to have that collection so that those students will know what's going on, what's important with uh, their students when they get to that place. Even if we didn't have the College of Education, I'm the kind of person who would probably be advocating for us to have a youth literature collection because I think it's uh, just sort of universally important. Last month, we were celebrating with the College of Education uh, a Children's Book Week. And uh, members from, uh, from the Education Department came in and read storybooks uh, here in the library. And it was amazing because most of them were not books that I'd heard before. Um, and there were books that were bilingual, being in uh, English and uh, Spanish or in uh, English and, oh, I'm gonna get this wrong, um, Korean maybe. Um, and we have several bilingual books like that um, in, in the section. Uh, and that's important because, uh, well, because not everyone speaks the same language. Um, and, but uh, just the differences in stories uh, to, to get the glimpse into an other person's life to see different cultural Uh, influences on your life, whether it is religion or just having a completely different cultural history to have been from another place and then come to America or to be from another place and still be in that place, um, you know, because um, I I don't know everything and, and kids' stories are part of learning about the world. And uh, I think that we should always be trying to do that, if that makes any sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, and I think that there are misunderstandings about what youth literature is or what it looks like, because I think that people assume that all youth literature is the cat in the hat, you know? Um, they get used to like, you know, chicka chicka boom boom, or books that look like this, you know, just a storybook. Um, and those are great. I actually love chicka chicka boom boom. It's a fun story to read uh, aloud because of the sounds and stuff. Um, or, you know, maybe people think that we'd have, you know, things like, you know, books of mythology which we do, we have. Um, I came with show and tell. Uh, I saw, objects. I'm impressed. Yeah. It took me all the five minutes walking through the aisles to find, find stuff. Um, but there's, uh, and, and those things are great, but there's also stuff uh, that allows us to take a look at the world um, that maybe we don't always see. Like we can look at, how people live in other countries, like in this book about the Ukraine, or how different kinds of people live in our own country, like this encyclopedia of uh, North American Indians. We can look at questions and concerns about uh, immigration 
in books like My Family Divided. Uh, this book is actually by uh, Diane Guerrero, who is uh, more known for being an actress. Um, she was in the TV series uh, Orange is the New Black. She was in the TV series uh, Doom Patrol. So it's more known for, for, for that. But uh, also issues about uh, refugees, like this book by uh, Malala, We Are Displaced. Or, you know, cultural things like the letter Q, which is uh, stories for youth uh, by and about being queer, you know? Um, and it's so broad because within our youth section, we have books on religion and history and social issues. And yes, we have a lot of fiction. But it's not just that. I mean, we have science books and cookbooks in uh, youth literature. Uh, the first cookbook that was ever mine, uh, and we don't have one in the in the library. I can't can't show it to you. Uh, oh. Was a uh, Charlie Brown peanuts cookbook, and it had really really simple uh, recipes in it, along with uh, cartoons, comic strips from uh, peanuts. But it was great, you know. Um, and I, I talked to you before about uh, uh, as as I grew up, reading was just important in our house. Uh, we had shelves full of books in our living room. We had, I think it was like the 1958 Encyclopedia Britannica and multiple dictionaries and lots and lots of fiction. We did the uh, hardbound Reader's Digest uh, condensed books. Um, I was in the uh, Book of the Month Club as a kid, so I got great books like uh, The Toothpaste Millionaire or um, My Sister the Horse, which is, yeah, uh, if you've never read, it's a great read. Uh, again, sadly, we don't own a copy, uh, but a uh, little girl clomping around pretending to be a horse. It's like, I'm a horse. Um, and, you know, I, I, and I grew up on, you know, more serious things like the Hardy Boys and uh, get, getting into that series of books and, and it's like that the world can be a mysterious place, but that, you know, you can figure it out if you work together and, you know, logic it out. Um, important lessons. So the, the thing that I feel like is true about kids' books is that that they are simple enough that even adults can understand them. <laughs> well, I know the turnout you had um, for the event earlier this year wasn't as good as you wanted. Um, are you again planning to do it in the spring or the fall? I would love to do the spring instead of the fall. I will never do it in the spring because, um, and it's, uh, it's, and, and I think there are probably multiple, multiple versions of this that are done, different organizations or whatever. The one that I've been looking at is uh, from an organization that I think is called uh, Every Child a Reader. And uh, they do two children's book weeks each year. They do one in the spring and one in the fall. The one in the fall happens in November. And November is a pretty good time for us as far as not being in the middle of a semester or, or right at the end of a semester. But the one in May is like the first or second full week of May, which would be like the middle of finals yeah. uh, for the spring semester. And that just would not work for us uh, as an academic library. It might be fine for a, a public library or maybe even a maybe even a school library to, to, to do it at that time. But uh for a college campus, we just we can't we can't do the spring one. Um part of the reason that the one this year was not as advertised as it should have been uh is because I had 
put all my time and energy um, into our uh, Halloween event. Yeah. And uh, I just didn't have anything left over to put into the children's book week. And I also know there were some um, some scheduling conflicts with it as well. There, there, there was some scheduling issues, um, and it was not this year. It was the first time we've ever done it. Um, it was not done as well as it could or should have been this year, even. Um, and so I can look at it in the future and think about what mistakes were made this time and how we can correct them. Um, because the Children's Book Week, we did, we had readings here Monday through Friday of that week. The way that the uh, event is scheduled is that it actually runs Monday through Sunday, a whole seven days. Uh, and I would I would really like to have it be so that at the same time of day, we have a storybook reading, some kind of reading, uh, all seven days of that week, including the mm -hmm. Saturday and Sunday. In order to make it be at the same time, um, all seven days, we have a more narrow window of when it yeah. could be, because on Sunday... We don't open until two in the afternoon. And on Friday, we close at five. So it has to be between two and five that week. So I'm looking at maybe three, three thirty, something like that, and could actually be the same time that whole week. And I think that you make announcements for that, you plan on it, you coordinate things with your department that wants to provide readers. And I think that that should be perfectly uh, achievable uh it just needs advanced planning one thing i suggested to you and you may have forgotten i suggested reaching out to student organizations yes. talk to a student and say what's your favorite children's book and have them read because i think one of the problems is we rely too heavily upon faculty and faculty a lot of times can't bring in the numbers that a student organization can yeah we um we had a, a big turnout on the first day, and I was really excited about it, except that the turnout was actually all members of one of the faculty people's classes. Yeah, that they wanted for, yeah. That, 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 yeah. that they, they had come and then actually required each of them to read a, a, a poem and participate in the reading. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, we did have a very small child uh one day of that week and uh it that was amazing because <sighs> this doesn't happen to everyone but uh specifically adults with working hearts have this reaction to children uh and pets that's exactly the same <laughs> which is that, oh, you're so adorable. Oh, how are you? What can I do for you? Oh, you know, uh, that kind of thing that happens. Uh, and specifically in a in a story time uh, environment, that was amazing. Uh, and honestly, this was a, a, a young child who was more interested in, you know, eating their Cheerios than listening or watching what we were doing. But uh, but it was it was really cool. That's an idea to do on the weekend. Maybe reach out to some of the faculty members at um, West Education who have younger children, yeah. and ask them if they would like to have their their child come up and read a story. Oh yeah, that could be that could be a neat thing. Yeah. Um, we we made a lot of notes about things that we could or or should do differently for next time, mm -hmm. and one of the things that we talked about was. Um, was reaching out beyond the campus community to uh, area, maybe elementary schools or daycares, uh, or there uh, there is a uh, city or county community of uh, that's a, a homeschool group that could have interest in that kind of a thing. Um, so yeah, just uh, 
just more networking and checking in with people, uh, I think would Im improve, improve the event. I agree. Yeah. Um, and as I told you, I said, um, even if you're not happy with the results, it teaches you what you should probably not do. I mean, I yeah. mentioned this before is I, one of the things I love about working here at MSU is we're not afraid to let you fail, you know, and, and stuff like that. Right. And sometimes, you know, we've, we've done projects before in the past that were just, nope, we're not going to do that again type of thing. But I, I love the fact that we get to play around with things and try things out and see what works. Yeah. For instance, um, maybe we should do a podcast for the library. Right, right. I, 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 I know, I know that that is a decision that still is sometimes questioned. Oh, yeah, it is. What's interesting, and I don't know if you knew this, but I want to say four years before this podcast started, four or five years before this, mm -hmm. what, the assistant director asked me to do my own podcast for the library. Uh huh. But the problem was, is like you just do it. You just you just do the thing. Uh huh. And I was like, um, no, because again, it was putting all of the responsibility and all of everything on it on me, basically, to do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not fair. It it's um it's not much of a burden, but it's still a weight that should be shared. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um I know that you have a story, an an, an anecdote about uh, uh, about <laughs> uh going to the library when you were young and like maybe did you even... want me to re recount that story? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my mom um, loves libraries. That's one of the reasons I'm probably a librarian today is she, 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 she is a regular weekly user of the public library in Richardson, Texas. And she was a, a weekly uh, uh, um, use, uh, user of the public library in, in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, when I was a small child. Mm -hmm. And um, she one day took me along with her basically to go to the library now that may have been because my dad was not was somewhere else and she had to basically i don't really remember uh -huh. um but um i remember going into the children's section and there were dolls they had dolls of various characters from various children's stories um up on top of the shelves and there was all these books with pretty pictures in them that i was just amazed by the thing that amazed me the most is there was this book on the Wizard of Oz. Did you know the Wizard of Oz was a book before it was a it was a t before it was a Thanksgiving TV show? Uh -huh. and, and again, at that age, I probably thought it was a Thanksgiving TV show, not a not a uh, not a movie that was made in the forties. That yeah, what or the thirties, whenever it was made. Anyway, yeah. um, but I was like, oh, I need to learn how to read so I can figure out what's going on because I looked at those pictures. Those pictures are vastly different than what I saw in in in, in the TV show. Yes, yeah. and that. I'm probably a librarian because of that fact, the very fact that today, because of that exposure. And I talked a little bit about that um, when we talked about our first. Um, yeah. I talked about my first library yeah. and actually had a picture of it. Um, it's still there, <laughs> which kind of surprises me because we all know that libraries are constantly being remodeled and redone and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. It was a small little branch library. And again, they had to I wouldn't even say it was it wasn't even its own room. It was like a small corner of the building, which was was uh, the children's stuff. But I do remember those dolls, and there may have only been three or four. But in my imagination, the place was filled with with dolls and all these colorful books with all these pretty pictures in them. Uh, we we were having a conversation about the Wichita Falls Public Library and its previous location. Mm -hmm. It's uh, currently, you know, well, and I say currently, but it's been there actually for a while, uh, mm -hmm. downtown on uh, Indiana, ten, between 10th and 11th uh, down down there. But uh, it used to be in a different location. D did you ever go into it when it was at the other location? I think they were in the process of moving when I first arrived here. If I, if, if I think that's what the, the, the time frame is. It was not as large a building, but it was in some ways more 
classically a library mm -hmm. because they it was the Vanderbilt type design of the library. Well, I mean, it, it had the it had the uh, ground floor and upstairs area, and the upstairs area you would climb a metal spiral staircase to get to, and and it was not as big as of course as the ground floor, and you could look down from there. And uh, my wife was talking about being taken to the library uh, by her aunt when she when she was young. Uh, and the thing about that, you'd go to the um, the kids book area, which she was saying was actually in a lower floor, like a basement area beneath the ground floor. Um, and you'd go and, you know, get your books or whatever. And then you'd come back upstairs and you'd look around and find your aunt on the second floor where she was and, you know, and then climb up there and get her. Um, and I, I didn't go to the public library in Wichita Falls much at all, but I, I remember going it and I remember it having that look. Um, and I thought it was beautiful. And so when it changed locations, it, they had, they had more floor space and they had a, uh, they put in uh, meeting rooms and things so that they could have, because libraries often end up being community centers for whatever the community yeah. is that they serve. Uh, our library is a community center for the MSU community. Um, and the Wichita Falls one is for, you know, Wichita Falls. But um, it didn't feel the same. I mean, there, there, there are things that I still love about our public library. They have some awesome collections. I still get things from them and sometimes still deliberately go into there, uh, specifically when I'm looking for usually graphic novels or the next book in a series that I don't want to spend the money to buy, you know, whatever. It's, it's a good library, it is. But at the time when I might have been using it, um I was in I was in Burke Burnett. I graduated from that high school and I used that library. And it's a smaller library, but um that's that's what I did. And it didn't occur to me to drive 20 minutes to to come to the Wichita Falls one. Um Thankfully, my wife loves to read, and we've instilled that into our kids. So we all love to read. And going to the library when the kids were younger was very much a thing that we did. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I do I do love a, a a classically styled library. I mean, it's not the the architecture of the library is by far not the most important thing of it but there's something nice about walking in and just going like yeah this is a library well what a lot of people might not realize either is at least here in texas for the last 30 years there has been an interlibrary loan program across almost all public libraries here in texas yes so the nice things about it is you can actually go in and order a book that the library may not have and they'll get it from somebody else and yep. that's um so again, if, if for those of you living in small rural areas saying, oh, my little pitiful little rural library won't have what I want, they can probably get it for you, just so you know. Yeah. Um, I do love uh I do love the interlibrary loan. Ooh. Wow. In the library so, bow? Yeah. <laughs> uh interlibrary loan program. Um I was here at our library, I was in charge of that department mm -hmm. for a bit. Um, and it is fascinating to see what libraries from other locations send us requests for things from us, and then also the flip side of that, where we get things from, because we have gotten in things from the Library of Congress, the New York Public Library, um, other college campuses like Rice uh, or Yale or Harvard, you know, whatever. Um, and, and yeah, and then sometimes from, you know, San Pedro Public Library or whatever, you know, just. I think I've told you this story before, but when I was, um, graduating with my undergraduate degree, a friend of mine was writing a thesis to, uh, to become basically magna cum laude. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
he did an ivory loan request for a book from Iceland. It arrived six months after after he ordered it, but it finally did arrive. So again, um, uh, it, it, it's interesting what what, what is allowed uh, to be yeah. lent out to other places. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And he was doing a book on Norse place names. If you want to know why oh, that book was okay, no, that yeah, that that makes sense. Sure. Um, well, and and I know that especially on a college campus, people think, okay, well, I can only use that for research, but that's not the deal at all. Um, I, I use ILL regularly for fiction books, graphic novels. I've gotten uh, movies in on DVD uh, through it, um, just anything. And it's free. It's already paid for by your tuition. You know, you're not, you don't pay uh, any extra money for it. So use it. We will say it is only free if you are currently taking classes. Yes, it if is. You graduated, it, it, it it's is, no longer free. It's no right. Longer it, to it, you. it is for current student <laughs> staff and faculty. Yes, that um, is. You're paying those fact. fees. If you're not paying your your your, your yearly fee in tuition, um, then yes, we're not going to help. But again, you can go to the public library yes. usually if you are a resident here, yeah. and they will. Um, it's the same system. So theoretically, yeah. anything we can get, they can get as well. Yeah, should be able to. Um, the There could be a difference because um, I know that here we have a, a dedicated, well, she is, but I mean, it's like a staff person who has been selected and designated as the person who's in charge of doing interlibrary loan. Um, and I think that some perhaps smaller libraries don't have that you they just have people that work in the library and occasionally they'll get an ill request and someone will go oh do we have this and do something about it um but yeah but yeah i i most any library in the world you you could get materials back and forth from other libraries and that is correct um be nice to your librarian um, bring them gifts and they will bend over backwards to help you. Yeah. Be mean to your library and you may not get that interlibrary loan request. <laughs> yeah. I hate to say that, but you are correct. There are libraries where, um, especially the small rural libraries, where the person may be overworked and they certainly, yeah. and they, again, one of the things about um, interlibrary loan, it, it, the policies are determined by the, the actual library uh, that you do the request from. And so they, their policies may be different than ours. So yes, I yeah, need, to, that, yeah, I need awesome. to mention that. And thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Okay. All well, right. we talked about a lot of things. Did you want to talk about what's going on in the area over the holidays? Yes, uh, I, I will. I have some stuff written down here. Um, and um, honestly, there's, um, because of the holiday season that we're in, there's actually fewer activities going on around on the campus. <laughs> Color me surprised. Right. Um, well, I hate we... to tell you this, but most of the faculty that I know, at least some of the faculty I know, they're gone. They're on the campus now. They're, they're, they've, you know, <laughs> yeah, they have to turn their grades in and stuff like that. But, you know, if they're doing online classes, oh, they're, they're, they're not going to even show up for office hours at all this week. And yeah. They're just they're just gone. They're 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 in the ether at this point. And they always go, Well, why are you gonna what? You're gonna be here next week? Why? I'm like, We because I have to work. I'm not like a faculty member who yeah. who can only work what you like the week before classes and then during classes and then can take off. Yeah. I even have to work during things like like spring break. Yes. It it is true. <laughs> it is true. Uh it's uh, we we're on campus more than students and 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 I guess more than faculty, yeah. Uh, as as staff, and I, I still get probably... faculty members that are like, "You guys are open on the weekend?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." <laughs> A little frustrating. A little <laughs> frustrating. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, on December sixteenth, twenty second, and twenty third. The Riverbend Nature Center has a lighted Christmas display of Electra Critters, uh, Wichita Falls Museum of Art at MSU Texas, 
is hosting on the wall workshops on Thursday, January 11th uh, at 5.30 and on Saturday, January 27th uh, at two. Then we have three different uh, art exhibitions that are all running the same time from Friday, January 19th through uh, Friday, February 16th, uh, but three different exhibits. Uh, the art exhibition, Not Alone, which supports uh, the Awareness Month for Women Trafficking, uh, is on display uh, in the foyer gallery of Faint Fine Arts. Then the uh, exhibition from the Ceramics Studio will be uh, in the Pit Gallery of Faint Fine Arts, that same time period. And then uh, over at the Juanita Harvey uh, Art Gallery, uh, they're presenting an exhibition uh, from ceramics artist Sana Musasama, all that same time period. Um, and that's really all that I found coming up. Uh, if you'd like to have more information about any of those events um, or other things that may be happening on or around campus or on or uh, around uh, Wichita Falls, uh, you can look those up for yourself on uh, the MSU Texas homepage under events or check out the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. And of course, if you have any events that you'd like us to mention in our podcast, or if you'd like to come on and talk about an event that you've got coming up, you can uh, zap us an email, library at msutexas.edu. And I guess that's it for this month. Yeah, I think that that's going to be it. I think that Chris will be back to join us for our uh, January podcast. Uh, where we should be having a special guest and we'll be in the podcast studio setup. Hopefully, uh, cross your fingers. Yeah, that is that. That is the plan. That is the plan for January. And of course, if that changes, our audience will find out a day or two after we do. Um, <laughs> well, actually, they may find out a day or two before we do sometimes, actually. that That is also <laughs> fair, honestly, yes. Uh, okay, but yeah, I think that that's uh, it for, for this month. So until next month, uh, I am, have been, and still will continue to be Joseph. This has been Club Moffat Talks. Uh, thank you for being here. Bye, guys.